So I'd, li I'd like to start by letting each of you give your name and uh, affiliation, and then we'll have a more extended uh, discussion of your particular areas of interest. So start, why don't we start with you, Angie? Okay, hello, I'm Angie Rosser. I'm the Executive Director of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition in Charleston, West Virginia. Hi, my name is Gautam Fancy, and I'm with Chevron. Good afternoon, I'm Dave Spiegelmeyer. I'm the President of the Marcel Shale Coalition here in Pittsburgh. Hi, my name is Denise A. Cobb. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey in Western Virginia. So, Vintage, University of Pittsburgh, thank you. All right, what I think we're going to do now is um, let each of you, reflecting on your knowledge of passion, um, talk a little bit about uh, what brings you to the table today in the area of reduced water. And uh, I, in any order you want, or I'll just go down the table. <laughs> so, when I'm going to go down the table, you've had a chance, so um, we'll turn to our next. Speaker. I can go for another 10 minutes. Yeah, I know, that's okay. <laughs> you can go in Q&A. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start. Um, so I am a microbial ecologist and biogeochemist. I, um, that's my background, and I've been working in the area of hydraulic fracturing and produced waters for the past six years. Um, at the USGS as an agency as a whole is doing research in the areas of produced waters and hydraulic fracturing across a number of different um, topics. So we're looking at both how, uh, what is the composition of produced waters across the nation and in different specifically produce water spills on water quality, environmental health, and ecosystem impacts. My research in particular has been focusing on the environmental, environmental health and water quality impacts of produced water spills. So I've been trying to understand what the actual impacts of uh, produced water spills are and what the time frames of those impacts are. So how long will a produced water spill persist in the environment and how will it affect either qu uh, water quality, environmental health, or so we've been using case studies, as Sue mentioned in her talk earlier, that case studies are an important part of understanding what those impacts are. And I agree with Radisad that uh, there has not been you know, a widespread systematic uh, effect on water quality and water resources, but we are seeing in case studies that there are definitive impacts and risk to the environment. So our case studies are across the United States in different uh, basins, and we're doing that to provide a national, under, national scale understanding of what the impacts are. You know, the geography and uh, ecosystems in the East Coast are not going to be the same as in California or in the Permian Basin. So we need this widespread approach to understand what the impacts are. Um, we are also using an interdisciplinary collaboration to really fully understand whether alterations to water quality result in some type of a health impact or an ecological disturbance. So my work um, was the first to show that there is a definitive impact to streams. Um, so we were working at a West Virginia wastewater injection disposal facility, and we saw that releases of produced water due to activities at that disposal facility resulted in geochemical changes that were correlated with potential um, aquatic health impacts. We followed that up with some work in North Dakota where there was a large uh, wastewater um, leak due to a pipeline break, and we were able to definitively show again that uh, changes in biogeochemistry due to that produced water spill led to aquatic health impacts. So we're continuing that work in a variety of different basins, and some of the key aspects of our approach is that we've identified uh, robust tracers of produced water spills, along with uh, this interdisciplinary approach that can link um, changes in geochemistry with actual health impacts and actual and we are also, I should mention, working across scales to so taking a laboratory approach all the way up to a regional and watershed approach to understand the spatial. Good afternoon. I'm Dave Spiegelmeyer with the Marcellus Shale Coalition. And while I look around the room, I see a number of friendly faces, but I also see a lot of technical acumen. I'm going to come here speaking from a scientific, scientific standpoint, but wanted to provide you some demographic information. I think it would be helpful to put some of, all, some of this in perspective, if I may. How many of you know how many wells were historically drilled conventionally in Pennsylvania? Anybody have an idea? About 4,000 wells were drilled conventionally in Pennsylvania. At our peak in 2008, we produced about 180 billion cubic feet of natural gas. Today, uh, after about 10 years of robust development of unconventional natural gas development, we've drilled about 10,600 wells in Pennsylvania, about 
8,600 of those wells are in production today. And we're no longer just producing a quarter of Pennsylvania's demand that we produced in 2008. We're now producing more than 20% of America's natural gas demand coming out of Pennsylvania. Add the 2,300 wells that have been drilled in Ohio and the 2,000 wells that have been drilled in West Virginia. And today, nearly 30% of America's natural gas demand from Appalachian Basin. Unconventional shale gas development and an economic winner for our country and for geopolitical outlook for energy supply and an enormous winner. I wanted to talk a little bit about rig count and where it's being on from an efficiency standpoint. While we hit a high water mark in 2011 with active rig count here in this basin in Pennsylvania, more than 111 active rigs. Uh, today, we're standing at 45 rigs in, this, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, back in 2011, average lateral length or horizontal development was averaging 2,000 to 2,500 feet of lateral length today um, through technology and an innovation. We're now we're averaging over 8,000 feet, many wells in the up to 10,000 feet. And the production in many of those locations is triple. Well, water use is certainly grown dramatically as well. Our production has grown dramatically and it's changed the outlook for natural gas supply. Uh, we're using about 7,500 barrels per uh, frack stage. Frack stage have been reduced from about 300 feet to 200 feet. We used about a million and a half gallons of water per thousand foot of horizontal development. So an 8,000 foot lateral, we're using about 12,000 or 12 million gallons of water. And I would share with you while we're you know, two and a half times the amount of water that we may have used in 2008, we're now producing three times the amount of natural gas. Economically, it's been an enormous winner for Americans. From an efficiency standpoint, again, it, uh, it takes us today about a gallon, uh, 1.05 to 1.5 gallons of water per MMBTUs of energy produced, compared to 2,500 gallons of water used to produce an equal amount of energy with irrigated corn ethanol. From a transportation comparison, since that's one that we can all touch, with, uh, have a touch point with every single day, it takes about three gallons of water to go 100 miles driven to compress natural gas. It takes 200 gallons of water to produce that equivalent amount of energy with the gasoline we put in our car today with the compressed ethanol blend with that irrigated corn ethanol. Um, as for disposal water, I know there's a lot of discussion around the, that matter today. About 10 to 20% of the water um, that goes down into a well today comes out in the first six to 10 months of production. Um, that water over the lifetime of that well will produce about 50% of the water that goes into the ground. Recycle operations today, as Radizov mentioned, is equivalent to more than 90% uh, of the produced water in Pennsylvania, meaning Water is taken to a treatment facilities in many cases. The metals are knocked out, and that water is then blended back with fresh water at the next hydraulic fracturing operation, lessening the need for fresh water and eliminating disposal. I would also share that many operators are using acid mine drainage water today as source water for hydraulic fracturing operations. And just quickly, I wanted to mention a case study in Pennsylvania, and that it's in early 2010, the Marcellus Shale Coalition, the group that I have the, the the honor of representing, we, we spent a fair amount of time taking a look at best management practices across our operations. We took a look at what was happening in terms of operators taking water to uh, public treatment facilities, and we saw bromide loading occurring um, downstream of those treatment facilities. We went to the DEP and suggested that that practice stop immediately. And in early 2011, and actually a, a a more, or moratorium was placed on taking any produced water from horizontal unconventional wells to public treatment facilities in May of 2011. So today, no volumes of water are taken to public treatment facilities. No waters are released to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania rivers unless they meet a 500 PS rule, um, basically uh, rendering water to an area type of standard and an NPDS permit be in hand before you can release water to the waters of the Commonwealth. So I think from an operational standpoint, it's been an enormous winner for technology innovations daily to try and improve our practice of managing water. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, my name is Gautam Fancy. I'm at Chevron. So just a brief background. I'm a chemical engineer. I have about 30 years of experience with oil and gas, uh, 12 of which are with Chevron. 
uh, I've uh, had various roles within Chevron, uh, project management, uh, strategy, and for the last three years, I've been with Chevron Technology Ventures. Uh, at Chevron Technology Ventures, my focus has been on produced water uh, and looking for innovative solutions to solve some of our business needs. Now for Chevron, we have multiple places where we have operations in California, Texas, New Mexico, Pennsylvania. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of produced water. Uh, some of the things that we notice is there are some common themes across each, each problem is unique because you have different chemistries and different water, but there are also some common threads across all different regions where we can apply common solutions. So, so our role within CTV is to actually look for innovative solutions. What we do is we are trying to push the boundaries of where technology is today. We are thinking of what we can do for tomorrow. And, and we basically work with small startup companies because that's where a lot of innovation is happening. And that's a gap that we feel is missing between the research being done in the academia and what's been commercially available. So we work with small companies uh, to actually do some field trials and, and commercialize those technologies for the industry. I mean, within Chevron, we use them, but also it's used for the industry. Uh, so we work with a lot of incubators, accelerators. We work with the, the innovation centers in various universities. We recently had a tech challenge, which we sort of announced some prize and called for a specific solution to solve our problems. So there are various ways with which we actually work with, with the industry to sort of look for solutions. Uh, we see, we basically monitor the trends that are happening in the technology. Uh, we see a lot of development out there. Uh, there are a lot of work in membranes. We have membranes, graphene membranes, graphene oxide membranes. Uh, there are some uh, nano carbon nanotubes. Uh, there are a lot of different technologies, uh, membrane displacement uh, technologies, some evaporation technologies, humidification, dehumidification technologies. Uh, so there's a lot of work that is happening. What I just mentioned is, yes, we are recycling a lot of water today, but tomorrow when all the fracking operations get over and we have a lot of extra produced water, we need to find solutions for those water. And that's what we are sort of looking at. What are the solutions out there for tomorrow that we can commercialized. So most of these technologies which we work with are not yet commercialized, but that's where we step in to sort of help them and, and get them into the commercialization stage. Okay, good afternoon again. Again, I'm Angie with the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. We are an NGO, statewide nonprofit, uh, large, funded by individual donations, private, private uh, foundations. Um, do work around policy, advocacy, community education, and organizing. And when I got the invitation to be here, I was like, you must have the wrong person. <laughs> I'm not a researcher. Uh, but when I, understand, when I understood the intent of this roundtable and panel, it was like, aha, this is exactly you know, the message I've been thinking about, is how do we bridge connections between researchers and community and policymakers and the industry because um, we are often operating in our own bubbles and that doesn't serve us well when we're having to address uh, big problems like produce water. So I'm, I'm glad to see the format of, of this um, day and that I was invited to participate. And what I want to share in my four minutes left is um, you know, where my expertise lies and where I gather um, that expertise is really talking to people and listening to real lived experiences of people who are, are living in our gas fields and being impacted by this industry. What these people who are often living in, in remote rural areas of West Virginia are seeing their lifestyles transform, their, their rural lifestyle transforming into a, a more highly industrialized a scenario. And, and personally, I will never forget the the, the day I got motivated to learn more about this issue when I was lobbying on, an, on a different issue at our state house, and there was a public hearing where a gentleman from Wetzel County talked about his family's tradition of stargazing at night, and that was a reason why they enjoy their rural culture and lifestyle. And he said when the well pad came in, the light pollution took away the stars. And that just impressed upon me about how profoundly this can really have an impact on community life. 
when, when families cannot enjoy stargazing anymore and that there's a lot more to talk about here. The two main questions I hear from communities are, are what, what is really going on here? I mean, we see images of tap water on fire and people start thinking the worst and they don't have access to the information being um, shared today, for example, in a way that they can understand it, right? So that's one of the things I think we have to figure out is how do we provide information, the, the research that you all are working on in ways that the public and policymakers can actually understand and apply to what their, their, their lived experience is. The other is, what, what about us? Um, what about our health? What about our quality of life issues? Um, and, and I think a lot of the people I talk to feel like they don't have much agency in the decision-making processes. And that's been a role of my organization, is to facilitate people participating in those processes. There are two barriers I see um, to opening these conversations when it comes to the community. One is there is a great deal of mistrust. Um, some of the non, the resistance to disclose some of the chemicals being used in the, the fracturing processes has led to, oh, these companies are hiding something from us. Um, if you look at the front page of the Charleston Gazette Mail today, you see um, a lease, um, landowner leaseholders who are, who are challenging uh, uh, one particular gas company for trying to reduce the royalty payments they're, they're receiving. So there's this perception that gas companies may be hiding something from us, that they're harming us in ways that they, we don't know, and they're just out there to, to profit off of us and, and aren't really taking you know, our, us into consideration. Um, there's also a barrier of, of helplessness, of feeling that um, we've seen a lot of pipelines coming through our, our um, communities using, invoking eminent domain and feeling like, um, you know, people who don't own, uh, only own surface rights and don't own their mineral rights, that they don't have any control over what is happening to their land or happening to their water. Um, and certainly a helplessness over the political influence that people see that the oil and gas industry has in places like West Virginia. Um, we had a major drinking water crisis happen in 2014 that resulted in a, a, a regulation around above ground storage tanks. Well, last year, uh, the oil and gas in industry was successful in getting all of their tanks exempt from that law. So no longer oil and gas tanks are, are regulated under that, that state law. So those, you know, those examples are, I feed that distrust, that helplessness that I think prohibits us from having the community conversations with the industry, with, with researchers um, that, and policymakers that need to happen. Um, and, and I think the other thing that I see uh, in working in policy in West Virginia, and this has been mentioned before, is that we're looking at uh, like huge increases in volume of produced water. And where is the plan for this? Because we're, we're, we're not seeing, and I think that's adding to the anxiety of what mistakes are we making now that we'll regret later, or where is the forethought um, for how are we going to handle this, pro this problem um, that, as we saw in some of the graphs, has the potential to really uh, over overwhelm this region. Thank you all. Um, I think set the stage for uh, some topics to be picked up and continued. Um, I could say, well, what would you like to pick for starters? Or I can give you a, an issue to start with. Um, do you have a preference? What's burning at the top of your minds right now as a result of these introductions? And if nothing, or someone's afraid to speak? All right. So you, you uh, well, I, I wanted to, I was inspired by Angie's comments there because um, we should come to our shale network conference because, and I'm not putting a plug in for the conference, just that, you know, what happened over the last six years that we've ran the conference. Initially, we just had concerned citizens who were trying to find information. Later on, we were able to get a DP. And we're able to get, because academics are coming in and out. And then finally, we had industry, DEP, citizens, academics talking about openly 
with the interest of understanding what's going on. And that, I feel, is, is a fantastic model that could be implemented elsewhere to try to initiate these discussions that you're so longing for to answer, you know, for the people that are living in these communities. And somebody has to take the lead and, and work through it and, and, and has, a, has a passion for it to organize these meetings. Eventually, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. And then people will start talking about these issues. And that goes a long way to understanding what's going on. To that, that there, I know that there's a need to communicate the science that we at the U.S. Geological Survey are producing in this topic, but what is the platform to uh, discuss that in, with the public, with concerned citizens or local um, uh, policymakers? For me, the main place that I'm communicating my science is through peer-reviewed literature and conferences. And while we have a major um, focus and an initiative to put out there that is accessible to public, and we have science features that give kind of the key points of our science. Something like the, the Shale Network Conference, which I've attended, it's fantastic. That would be a great thing to have in the state of West Virginia where we've done work, that there was a, a platform where scientists like myself could come and talk more freely and openly to the public and answer questions. So it's, for me, it's not really having a clear way that I can, um, it's not a clear platform for me to do that, even though I would like to be able to have that opportunity. I agree we need the platform, and I was talking to my neighbor, Jean, back there about this, and, I, you know, as researchers, I mean, I, the stuff you say is highly, I mean, some of the stuff has just gone over my head today, all right? How is there training for researchers to be able to write in a, in a non-journalistic way to communicate um, with the general public uh, media training? Um, that's so important because that's where people are getting a lot of their information. You know, where are they getting their information? Not through their journal subscriptions. <laughs> They're getting it through mainstream media. And where, where are, where is the researchers there? And how, you know, part of it again is is being able to communicate your work and the implications and the ways that the community understands. And I think as importantly as policymakers, right? These are not scientists who are making these decisions. And it's often our challenge to try to understand what you all have come up with and you know, through our lobbying efforts, educate them in three minutes um, about the vote they're about to cast. So with platform and communication style. I don't think I would steal from our elected officials that they're required to find the best available uh, science in the making of their decision making. I, I would just say that you know, our industry has been focused from day one to make sure we get this equation right. We've watched technical innovation, Radisoff talked about where the beginning of recycling came from. The industry took the changes to, of wastewater disposal in Pennsylvania to reuse, to new technical innovation and crystallization and different disposal techniques. We took it to the legislature to, um, to disclose frac chemicals and then fracfocus.org, a public database for release of frac chemical usage uh, broadly across Pennsylvania, that every, every every truck that's hauling chemicals has MSDS sheets with full disclosure of what's on board. I mean, this has been, while we're accused of not being transparent, I would share with you that our industry is focused on transparency. I, I represent a coalition and many folks think it's comprised of folks from Texas and outside, the, outside our state. I would say 95% of our board members are Pennsylvanians. They like to hike and bike and hunt and fish and camp and do all the things that Pennsylvanians want to do. We want to make sure we get it right in Pennsylvania and we're not leaving a legacy of destruction behind us. I think we've been pretty successful there and we've changed the outlook for domestic energy supply with every utility in Pennsylvania today having natural gas rates anywhere from 57 to 81% less than what those costs were in 2008. It's been an enormous winner for all citizens but especially those low income consumers that struggle to pay energy bills, it's put money directly into their pockets. Can, can I um, add, would you, uh, Andy, pick up a little bit on communication with the general public? Because I know that that's an issue of responsibility for the USGS, and I know that you have some ways you do that, and I think it partly adds to um, Angie. So, Denise, what do you think? 
Yes, I mean, we have an excellent communications department um, at our headquarters, um, and there's a communications specialist at many of our regional offices. So, you know, I have partnered with them to get training on how to talk to the media, but, and we also, again, are doing fact sheets and science features where we're working with someone who's trained in public communication to help us put the information out there in an accessible manner. We also, th this, we've also made it for the project that I co-lead with two other colleagues, we've made it a commitment to make all of our pub publications open access immediately. I know that that again is not, you know, going to be communicating it at a public level, but at least the data is there. And I would just say that I, I as a scientist can communicate effectively to um, someone, to a reporter, but how they're going to interpret the information I've provided is out of my control. So I would encourage anyone, if you have questions about our science, we're just an email away. And I we have many, on many occasions, spent an hour talking to a concerned citizen about what the implications of our studies mean and what the balance is between the, um, the environmental impacts and, and the um, economic uh, needs of, of that science, of energy production. But it's not simple. And it's definitely, I should say, I would say from the scientific community, it's changing our commitment to communicating effectively at all levels is definitely something that we're getting much better at. And in my 15 year career as a scientist, it's much more of a focus now than it was at the beginning. If we can't share what we've learned, then um, what's the value of it? We need to be able to do that. So, so let me, um, having, this is an excellent introduction to some science and technology. Because it is um, important to us as practices in that field, whether we're in industry or whether um, private consulting or whether we're academics or administrators, it is important to communicate um, science, science principles, engineering principles. And so um, let, me, let me change your direction and this will give a couple of other people opportunity to speak. What are the limiting technologies that we need to change the problems that we've talked about this morning. So if one of you would like to jump in the deep end, uh, I think we'd enjoy that conversation. Well, I think Gautam gets sales pitches all the time. He can <laughs> take a shot. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but I was hoping <laughs> you could start him. Well, that, that is, you know, of course, everything I talk about is there's no business aspect to it at this point because I'm only worried about science engineering. The, where does it fit in the overall scheme of things? That is something that the oil and gas companies and water management companies are much better equipped to talk about. Um, in terms of technologies, we do have some solutions that are already available to the industry and there are some plants that are producing in Pennsylvania, they're producing drinking water quality out of produced water at a cost, of course. And so, of course, that's a small plant and, you know, it, it includes everything from mechanical vapor recompression to crystallization to biological treatment. We have a plant in West Virginia that's going to do the same thing. Um, so, the technology is already available. The only thing that needs to be implemented is the driver driving forces to actually develop these technologies as long as there is a reuse option that's the least cost alternative nobody is going to go after these treatment processes unless they're forced to do that right now industry in texas is going to inject in the ground as much as they can because that's the least cost option industry in united in pennsylvania is going to recycle as much as they can that's the least cost option but if there is a, some way of doing the analysis and predicting what is the water quality management going to cost in three years, in five years, in 10 years, then I can figure out where my technology comes into play, where it becomes relevant, and I can gear up my demonstration plan to say in seven years, when the cost comes to be $6 a barrel, then I will be competitive at 550, so I want to have, be at the market. That, that is a very, that, that's a missing piece in this whole uh, alternative of, of managing produced water at the current uh, approaches that's missing, that's stifling innovation. Because right now there are a lot of companies that have been set up to look at these technologies and then the opportunities do not materialize and they go 
bankrupt. And so, because they're too early to the market. And so it needs to be some prediction as to, but honest prediction where everybody actually says, here's where we think volumes are going, here's where we think our management options are going so that we can kind of estimate you know, where the prices are going to be and then come in with a technological, technological solution. I'd like to add to that, that it's not just the volumes or types of produced waters that are being produced, but it's also the water withdrawal needs. So the USGS are, is actually working on a water availability and use related to oil and gas development, because in certain areas, water availability is highly limited, and that's going to make reuse even more cost effective. And so as our water needs become more and more dire in, in very arid areas or places where you're affected by drought, that need for those technologies is going to become more and more economical. And okay, so it could be in a regional level kind of studies, you know, in this region, this is what we see developing in that region. So yeah. that kind of analysis could be done and made available publicly so that all of these industries that are had brilliant solutions and ideas. We mentioned graphene oxide, you know, ca carbon nanotubes, all these technologies are brilliant, but the question is what do they cost and when do they become competitive? So I think you'll have sort of hit the nail on the head because there's no one single solution for everything, right? If you look at across the US, you can look at across Pennsylvania, you can look at the different areas in Pennsylvania. The challenges are unique. You've got different chemistries for, for water and it's gonna look for different solutions. Uh, and, and, and that's what makes this more challenging and, and makes it much more sort of interesting. Uh, there are certain technologies that are there, as you pointed out, uh, which are existing today, but I think the key is they should be cost effective. You're gonna be looking at what's the alternate solutions and, and can, can these compete with the alternate solutions? And that's sort of the drive towards technology. Can we make these compete with the existing solutions? Uh, technologies which are there, we have reverse osmosis, which is well-established, but there are limitations in terms of the tedious it can uh, sort of uh, process. Uh, there are other technologies that are coming up. Uh, again, they are not yet commercialized, but they are there. They are there in the background, and I think there's a lot of work going on by different companies and different uh, individuals to sort of get these technologies into, into play. So, so it's not a single solution, but uh, I think the industry is going in that direction. Can you tread lightly and explain um, what these technologies are um, in terms of um, the, the audience we have co connected here today, as well as our online participants and our very important community advocate? Okay, I'll try. Yeah, no, I know you can do it. <laughs> so, so if I look at what's happening, uh, so membranes are used, used effectively to sort of uh, remove the constituents of the water. So you have various constituents in the water. You have various ions in the water. The basic is salt, sodium chloride, uh, but you have calcium chloride and other constituents in water. You mainly have, initially when produced water comes out, you have a mixture of oil, sand, and, and all these various constituents. So you have technologies to remove first the sand uh, and the oil, and those are very standard technologies. You can use uh, gravitational separation to separate the sand. You can use uh, things like walnut shell filter and flotation sort of technologies to remove the oil. But once you go down from there, you have to use more advanced technologies to, to get the oil out to less than one ppm and get the individual constituents out to where you can actually discharge water. Uh, so there is a lot of development in, in, in membranes. Uh, graphene and graphene oxide membranes the advantage of those is that these are very thin membranes, so you can do it in a very energy efficient way to separate it out, which reduces the cost. Uh, you have carbon nanotubes. Again, you can have thin membranes, and it's again an energy efficient way. But again, these are not yet commercialized, so a lot of work has been going on in the, in the academia and some of the small companies to sort of develop these. Uh, but when you look at the technologies, I mentioned reverse osmosis. Uh, is one technology. Uh, forward osmosis is another technology which you can reuse to clean up the water, desalinate it, and discharge that water. Uh, you have uh, membrane distillation technology, uh, which is more efficient than the other technologies. Then you have the thermal technologies. You have 
different evaporation technologies where you can distill the water to make it pure before discharging it. Uh, mechanical vapor compression has been sort of mentioned over here. You have humidification, dehumidification technologies. So there are a lot of different technologies that are being developed. Uh, again, it's a question of are these cost effective? Can you improve the efficiencies of these technologies so that they are competitive with the existing alternatives? So to, to summarize, I mean, there's a lot of work going on in this to sort of try and address this. So there's been a question about the ability of the industry to technically innovate. And I would just share that the reason we're sitting here today is the fact that the industry is highly technically innovative. And the fact that in 2007, eight, seven and eight, we were a conventional industry that drilled or uh, vertically in Pennsylvania, that we learned how to drill wells horizontally. And it would have taken us 60 days to drill a well with a 2000 foot lateral. Um, I, I hear our public spokesperson on my left and your right talk about light interference. I would share with you to, that a well with an 8,000 foot lateral today is being drilled in 20 days, that we can drill a pad out uh, with five or six wells in a couple of months. And those are a single well today will provide enough energy to fuel 175,000 homes. We've gone from a period in the 70s of uh, tight supply. I would share with you in the Carter administration years, we put the Fuel Use Act in place because of uh, uh, what we viewed was a tight supply at high price today a period of abundance and affordability that's multi-generational i believe and it's been driven by technical innovation when there are challenges in this industry and i would share that we have a research collaborative that we invite folks from academia they don't have to be members of the msa to participate in that but i would share with you that the FLIR camera that's now being used by regulators across the country to detect methane uh, was developed in our research collaborative at the MSC. That was, I, those were ideas that, brought, that were brought forth by technical innovation to capture methane. Folks are making strong claims about methane contamination. We sell methane. That's our product that we take to the meter. We have every incentive in the world to capture every molecule of stuff. And I would share with you today the fact that we're burning natural gas and power generation we're at a 25 year low in carbon dioxide emissions. You don't read that anywhere. We're going to meet the demands of Paris because of the fact we're using natural gas and power generation and more rapidly in our economy today. So we've reduced uh, not only carbon dioxide emissions, but <coughs> sulfur dioxide emissions, nitrogen dioxide emissions, particulate emissions uh, by displacing now uh, much of our coal supply to use natural gas. Uh, for about 38% of the electrons being produced in Pennsylvania. So, so this topic of technology, um, very well provided by you, is important, I think, because it's easy to, for communities and also people who are, are not thinking at the level of communities, but, but others in policy making at, at all levels, um, sometimes shut the door on their open thinking because they don't understand. And so um, would anybody else within your particular field of knowledge like to comment on what, what is the future, what's been innovative, and what's made a big change? Just the get, ability, get them going, the please. Ability, the ability to turn a drill bit horizontally has been a generational change that have opened up vast supplies of natural gas for generations to come. It's technical innovation. And I see people from our university systems, our students today are highly technically innovative and have made game-changing contributions to our industry. We were actually lucky that Mr. Mitchell was doing these experiments when the oil was fairly expensive, gas was $12, you know, instead of two and so forth. So that all fell into place. Plus we had infrastructure here a lot of the countries outside the United States are looking at our example and are thinking, well, we're going to go ahead and do the same thing like the U.S. We have the shell formations and whatnot, but they don't have the infrastructure and know how to actually implement that. And so that was a set of circumstances that I think was pretty unique in the U.S. when that revolution occurred. I, I think Radisson mentioned that 90% uh, of the water is recycled in Pennsylvania. And I think 
people don't realize it, but that's a big change for the oil and gas industry. I think that's a big innovation for oil and gas. I mean, it, it really was uh, something that they had not done before. They were not sure how to do it. They were not sure what the impact would be. And, and to actually make it happen is a big, big change. It's a big change direction. Um, we wanted to touch on territory and how it's easy to, for us to say the water composition varies. But can we uh, think a little bit about what that really means in terms of either impact or treatment or um, to an individual who's worried about, you know, how, how does this impact me? They don't necessarily know um, what the details of this composition are. What does variability mean both technically and to an end user? Well, I can address that. We, I did some work um, looking at 13 shale gas wells in Pennsylvania, um, and my colleagues and I were both looking at organic compounds, volatile organic compounds, and total dissolved solids. And while the total dissolved solids are pretty consistent across those produced water samples, this was in north central Pennsylvania, and they were much, much higher than what is being measured in southwestern Pennsylvania. So I think it's important for people to realize that the treatment technologies that need to be applied in north central Pennsylvania are going to be different than even southwestern. Even another really important part of that study was looking at volatile organic compounds. They were not abundant in every single, they weren't measurable, detectable, or even at any measurable concentration in the majority of those wells. Uh, I'm sorry, produced water samples from, from wells. So if only three out of 13 have all the organic compounds, those are VOCs that have the potential to have a health impact, those three waters are gonna need a very different type of treatment or handling practice than the rest of them. So that variability is a really important part of thinking about how do stakeholders manage these waters? What is the needs for different types of storage tanks? Do they need to be open? Do they need to be closed? And so understanding that not all wells are gonna be having the same produced water composition is important, I think, for the public to know because that's going to change how we need to deal with those components. But I, I would ask Angie to perhaps comment on wh what would public need to know and in what format and how to be able to say, okay, we are okay with it. I remember when we were early on in this, you know, 2009 or so, eight or nine in Pennsylvania, and I went to public meeting in a, in a public forum in, in rural Pennsylvania, the people there were saying, you know what, we kind of know this is good, it's a good industry and so forth, but can you guys make sure we don't get the short end of the stick in all of this? Because they, they didn't understand what are the issues that are coming to uh, uh, roost, you know, in their neighborhoods. And, and so they just say, well, we're all for it, it's great, I'm gonna be able to buy a new truck and whatnot, but you know, I wanna make sure the long term we don't get at the short end of the stick. And so I don't know how to uh, convey that information to the public. And perhaps, you know, Angie works with the people all the time, maybe can tell us what to do. <laughs> well, it's difficult. And, and I think, you know, the unfortunate reality, and it's probably true for a lot of industries, is that one bad actor colors a whole industry. And Denise, I'm curious, were you in Lock Galley? Is that where you yes, did? Yes, that's where okay. I did the work. Yeah, you <laughs> so, know about that site. <laughs> Everyone it's knows an about example that. of an operator who was just awful. I mean, at time after time, just messy, and I think it was more mainly the spills and mishandling of the produced water. Um, well, I will just state that we don't, no, were not able to identify the direct route to the environment okay. of those wastewaters, but that was a real key part of what we walked away not knowing. Um, we tried to go back and do some studies, find out how was that impact occurring? You know, was it some type of minor spill that just happened repeatedly where there's some kind of more major thing that had happened and we lost site access. And that's a real key part, not only to the environment, but also the people who are working at these facilities. You know, what is their day-to-day -day operation? How can it be improved or, or adjusted? So, yeah. Right. Yeah. But the local community, you know, they were pointing the finger at this Correct. one operator. <laughs> no, no question. <laughs> who kept yes. getting his permit renewed. And I, so I think, to, you know, to try to answer this question is, is what the public needs to see is, is a, a, a coordinated effort between the industry, the scientists, the technology, and the regulators. Mm -hmm. I mean, they need to hold these bad actors accountable. 
And when there's not that accountability and not that enforcement of the laws, then, you know, there's just no trust across the board. So you've got to have all the pieces working together, I think, to really instill that public trust. So, um, general word on the street is, of course, that academics are free to release information about a possible existence, and um, many, many um, industries, not all of them, and may not mm -hmm. be the ones you sit at the table um, on behalf of, have restricted distribution of information <laughs> for a variety of reasons, including their interest in commercialization and um, conflict of issue, interest kinds of things. So, so as a group, do you think that information, data, approaches um, are not well understood or released in some areas, or is this a very open community where a lot is known? I, I, I found early on that there was a lot of um, I don't, I don't want to use a strong word here, but a lot of companies are selling this additives and chemicals and we got the best thing, you know, you use our FR300 and it's going to be the best and whatnot without releasing what's in there thinking that that's their competitive advantage. And, and I, I seriously doubt that, you know, that was a competitive advantage, you know. I think there's a lot more advantage to be gained if you actually disclose what's in there because you're already making it and you already have your customers and so forth and I don't know that hiding what's exactly in that chemical formulation uh, is going to hurt you. In other words, you have a ingredients but you don't give them the recipe and therefore you keep your, your competitive advantage but at least if you tell the ingredients are in there that will go a long way towards building a trust and we would know what to look for in this produced water sample and so forth. You don't have to, you know, tell me what the recipe is, exact measures and mixtures or whatever, but just to, what to look for. That, I think, is one way to overcome this public trust issue. I think so just to add that uh, I get a chance to watch a number of technical committees in operation pretty regularly. And I see an incredible amount of information sharing. Now, there may be uh, competitive information in terms of folks working on innovative solutions that may not be shared with different technology challenges, but I've seen an industry come together pretty rapidly to address specific issues and try and make sure they have innovative solutions to manage those properly in the public interest. Uh, and, and usually public interest becomes uh, a corporate interest as well, because if you're doing something right, you're going to sell a technology that creates a, a business opportunity for your company as well. I, I would tell you, we wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for the advanced technical innovation that's industry has displayed over the last decade. So I'm mindful a little bit of the time, and we don't know how many people would like to ask questions. We've got some pretty big issues on the table. So what I'd like to do is open this up for questions and then if we have not so many, I'm going to come back to you with a couple of final um, challenges. So uh, if you have a question, please come to the microphone and um, will, will somebody keep an eye on the um, online questions for me, please? Please introduce yourself. I will do that. I am Rick McCurdy with Chesapeake Energy. And I want to touch base on this confidential business information thing because this thing just always gets underneath my skin. Number one, the idea that the industry is being deceptive and not willing to disclose what's in these products. We don't control that information. We don't create those products. We buy those products from vendors that make those products. If they're claiming confidential business information or trade secrecy for an ingredient in that, that there's nothing we can do about that. And that is a federal and state trade law. That applies to every industry, not just people supplying the oil and gas industry. Those products, they to get that uh, trade secret disclosure, they have to put the entire recipe, the entire ingredient list before the EPA and say, this is what's in here. This is why we want to c consider this confidential business information. And the US EPA has to approve that. 
and they, you still have to list if there's health hazards associated with that ingredient, they still have to be on the safety data sheet. So it, there are provisions in place and that's not something that's unique to the oil and gas industry. Now, Wendy, you started out by saying, what is the one thing that you wanna see come out of this, right? One thing. All right, here's my one thing. I'm a huge advocate at some point in the future of recovering some volume of fresh water out of uh, oil and gas brine and returning it some beneficially to the environment. One concern we have, and there's, there's people in this room that have that concern is, how do we know that's as safe as it can possibly be? How do we know there's some ingredient that's in there that we don't know how to measure for, we don't have an analytical technique? And if you say, well, we're gonna let you do that, but we want you to analyze 200 different items every hour on that discharge, well, it's never gonna happen. So what can we do to ensure the public, if that brine or if that treated water is gonna be reintroduced to the environment, how can we assure the public that it's gonna be safe? So I would say that's a good question for you. It's a challenge, Rick. I can, I, I'll take a stab at it though. I think the key point is that you identified said that we need to be measuring specific compounds. And I think that's the wrong approach. What we need to be doing is bioassays. We need to be thinking about a whole mixture because you can have five, one individual compound by itself and it might not have an effect. But if you put 10 separate compounds together and synergistically affect an organism, all kind of glob together for a bigger effect. And we have some really advanced technologies that are coming out just in, the, 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 in this field that are gonna allow us to do that. So high throughput bioassays are a major component of where um, you know, toxicology is moving, where we can use genetic receptors and cell lines to look at these um, potential health effects. And those are gonna be the key thing, in my opinion, for being able to answer whether or not these waters are safe. And you know, we can even be doing whole animal studies. Those are still more challenging to do, but analytically we will never be able to measure, or it'll be years before we can measure every little thing. And we can't measure something if we can't find it. But you can measure an impact, or sorry, an effect on a receptor. And I think these high throughput bioassays are the, the key part of, of um, being able to inform the public. So not only does no, that need to be a second. Let, let me, let me, I'm limiting you to one question. All right. And I, I, wa I want to make sure um, we're still on your question. What, who else on the panel would like to answer? Well, I mentioned that risk quotient, which is a risk based, you know, based on the uh, uh, impact on the living organisms mm -hmm. as a concept, rather than trying to identify every little compound and we can go to nanogram and picogram per liter levels and so forth and still not know what does it mean. So I think okay. the risk-based uh, type approach to discharge limitations is much better suited for this soup, you know, of, of chemicals that are out there rather than going out there specific ones. The other thing that you can argue is that, you know, organics are likely to degrade over time. Inorganics are likely to stay in effect the uh, uh, grass or vegetation or whatnot. And so that also ought to be taken into account, you know, if that happens, what is the fate of these organics and how long do you feel this uh, risk effect, you know, uh, over time for discharge? And can I just add one more thing? Absolutely. One of the things we're talking about is proprietary chemicals and what's going in is hydraulic fracturing fluid. And now we don't know what comes back out. These fluids are pumped in at very high pressure to the deep, deep subsurface. We are dealing with pressures and temperatures and chemical reactions are occurring. And there's not been a systematic mass balance of what goes in and what comes out in terms of the organics. And many of the studies that are out there have looked at a neat compound and shown that it can have a biological effect. But that biological effect has not been measured in that mixture. And that has also not been you know, if that compound disappears or is degraded in the deep subsurface, that's one less component in that produced water that needs to be of concern. Right now, the USGS is working on that. We're trying to do a mass balance um, where we've had hydraulic fracturing fluids and we're following the life cycle of the water to be able to understand what goes in and what comes back out and how does that translate to a risk if there is one. 
Dave, do you have some perspective add to this from the um, coalition? I see there's other questions here, but I would just tell you that we're continuing to look every day at the challenges of what comes out of the ground. Uh, you know, what we're doing to inspect and get analytics on water. I think Denise made it clear that, you know, clearly the chemical composition of water that's returned to the surface in the northern part of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania may be different than mm -hmm. in the southwestern part of Pennsylvania. We got an underpressured area of the shale that produces a heavy hydrocarbon base in the southwest when we have a very high quality dry gas play in the northeast it's a it's a it's one of the few places in the country where we have a dramatically different play 250 miles apart we have we don't have a heavy oil play in the western part of pennsylvania but we have ethane pentane butane isobutane propane and ngls being produced here that are non-existent in the northern part of the play it's a major it's a it's a dramatically different play in the north it is in the southwest and along with that variability in different basins you can be producing from more than one strata so you could have very different chemistries in a vertical space and that's a situation we're dealing with in the permian basin and trying to identify what what environmental effects could there be okay but the produced waters from four different strata are not created equal because of the different histories so that's an important part of the variability okay. so so a good question but that opened quite a lot of uh, new doors Yes, please give your name. Uh, John Stoltz, Duquesne University. Um, I'd like to refocus on the brines um, and start with saying that not all brines are created equally and the ones coming from the Marcellus are, or in shales in general, because of the uh, uh, nature of radium, is naturally far more enriched in radium than standard uh, coal bed mines, uh, brines, and uh, even conventional brines because of where they're coming from. And uh, why this is important is because of the efforts at beneficial reuse of the brines, and even that our own Harrisburg legislature is, is considering redefining brine as a natural product and will no longer be regulated by the DEP. Uh, why this is a concern is because there's a product on the shelves of Lowe's and other hardware stores in Ohio called Aquasalina. It's a de-icer. The ODNR recently did a study and found that at least one of the products had over 2,500 picocuries of radium in the product itself. We just got a sample, we're testing it right now. But I can also tell you, in addition to the ancient seawater that's on the label as what it's made from, uh, it has high levels of arsenic and lithium and a number of other things. So again, I caution and question that in particular, the brines coming from the shales, that they're enriched in things that aren't, haven't been seen in more traditional uh, extractive industries and making sure that, you know, as far as even with the Marcello Shale Coalition, that your uh, members are aware of these things and, and are keeping an eye on it. Thank you. So your question My is? question is, what is, yeah, what is the industry doing uh, and uh, with, and, and even the science uh, to address the radioactivity issue? Thank you. That's a great question. It's all yours. I, I would just say that uh, we've taken a very hard look at, at radium. We've worked closely with the DEP. Our primary issue is in sludges, not in the produced water. If there are sludges, con uh, condensed sludges, those are areas where you have potential con concentrations that need to be managed. I, I would also just share that our industry has not advocated for placing brines on uh, public highways. I know some I have made a uh, presentation this weekend, this week on Public Health made a presentation about applying brines to, to dirt roads. We've not advocated for that as a shale coalition. Um, certainly if you uh, use a crystallization process that can render uh, a pure salt, potentially there's an opportunity there, but uh, it's not something we've advocated for. I know that there's a comment made that there's legislation pending. I would tell you that there's no serious legislation pending to release brine water to uh, to aquifers to put it on roads. There's no serious consideration in Pennsylvania legislature to do that. And we've not advocated for it. Thank you. So, so do I have any questions from the um, remote audience? No? Okay. Please. I'm Ron Zagrocki from Bucard Horn. I'm an engineer, I often work with municipalities. Um, one of the worries with sort of an uncertainty on what chemicals would be in these waters is often, you know, if something does show up, how do I trace it back to the, the, the creator of the problem or 
if I think there might be a problem, what am I looking for? And I know in produced natural gas, you have a tracer chemical added to give it a smell. In uh, potable water, most places add fluoride so they can distinguish a water leak from groundwater. Has there been any research into any kind of a uh, tracer additive that would be a non-harmful indicator that we could use to say, aha, this is from a, a well? There, I mean, a Radoslav probably is as good as this as any, and we have folks in the audience that know this as well. There's a thermogenic makeup to gas in various uh, hydrocarbon bearing stratas. They know gas that's coming out of the Devonian shales differ from those that come out of the Marcellus, that differs from those that come out of the, the Utica. So there is a way to um, use a chromatograph to be able to determine what the, what the footprint of gas may be, and if it's dissolved in water, you can certainly find out where it came from pretty quickly, and that is um, a technology that's used pretty regu regularly in Pennsylvania today. Uh, it, it's used, you know, your, your average municipality is not going to be able to do any of that, you know, because it requires a very sophisticated equipment to analyze the isotopic ratios and whatnot. But there are studies that have looked at, you know, the ratios of uh, um, elements and in the brines, you know, and, and be able to pinpoint where it came from. So it's possible. It's still, you know, I would say more in academic realm in terms of tracing the waters. You know, it is possible and requires a lot of work that an average municipality just simply cannot do. The USGS, though, has developed different tracers, uh, light hydrocarbon signatures, which is similar to what you guys are talking about, and that is closer to being applicable. Um, that is a, 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 an analysis that can be um, done for municipalities in that, that realm. Which is the gas or the water? This would be, oh, good point. Um, thanks, sorry, okay. I should re-speak. These are tracers of the produced water. And so looking at dissolved light hydrocarbons in streams are a way of tr tracing back even produced waters because that would be um, a signature that is dissolved in the produced water. But we are using a lot of different isotopic ratios and specific um, elements. So a conductivity measurement is not going to provide you with a full answer of whether or not a produced water spill has occurred and what the source of that water is. You need more detailed chemistry and we'd be happy to talk more about that later. But we, we've been developing some kind of key elements, key constituents that are um, important to measure to help identify that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Good. Any more questions? Excellent. We have time for maybe one or two at most. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Leah Harper. I'm from Ohio. And I'm an impacted community member that has pretty much closed the door on the industry from what I've seen is all the preemptive legislation that was introduced, especially as uh, the industry was trying to figure out how to get the gas out of the ground back in 2005. Did the industry say we've got to have these Halliburton loopholes that no other industry can have? And did the industry actually lobby to get those loopholes? And do they continue to do so, so that we don't have the bonding requirements or the severance taxes that we're going to need for the legacy cost uh, this industry will leave? Angie, can I um, ask you to begin that dialogue? Because I think that you are um, a good interface for us with community questions. And then we'll see where it would like okay. to go. <laughs> um, well, well, Thank you for being here. I mean, it's so unusual that a person who probably has another day job can take a day off work to come to this kind of forum um, and be a voice. And, uh, you know, their Halliburton loophole is, is one example of where um, we've seen federally and in the state, it appears that laws are made to create um, loopholes or um, things that would compromise um, public safety and you know what we heard in West Virginia last year when the industry wanted to exempt themselves under the above ground storage tank regulation is that most of our tanks are brine and brine is just salt water and there's nothing to worry about. That was the message which is a very different message than what I'm hearing on this panel today that there are things we acknowledge and are taking seriously. That is a different message than just nothing to see here, nothing to worry about. We've got this covered. 
And along with that message, again, what I brought up earlier about the, the regulators. Um, I can speak for West Virginia. There's a lot of public criticism around the regulators. Either they're not, they're not resourced in the way they need to be to um, provide the adequate oversight of this rapidly growing industry, or that you know, they are politically motivated to turn their heads the other way because this is such an economic driver for our state and economic hope for, for this region. Um, so I think, I think that's a good question. Of, I, I would like to hear the responses of, of those criticisms and um, those perceptions that really lawmakers are kind of in the hands of the industry to do, do what they need to do to advance development as quickly as possible. So, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I don't speak for Ohio or West Virginia. I would share with you the industry in Pennsylvania in late 2011 and in the passage of Act 13 in 2012 put in place an impact fee that is spread broadly to all 67 counties of Pennsylvania that does not go into the general fund that today would nearly 100% of those funds would go into uh, a failing pension system. Instead, those dollars are spread broadly to all counties and communities across Pennsylvania. I think it's been an enormous winner. It's generated nearly $1.5 billion of proceeds in the last six years. Um, I would also share with you as part of Act, th Act 13, there were a significant number of environmental enhancements made to the regulatory platform in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Many of them were advocated for by the industry, including disclosure of frac, frac chemicals. It may not be the the secret sauce, so to speak, of what the exact blends are, but the chemicals used in hydraulic fracturing in Pennsylvania at every single location are disclosed and required to be disclosed under Act 13. Um, there are additional environmental enhancements made broadly to Pennsylvania, and the comment made of economic benefit to our region, there's no mistaking the economic benefit to our region. We've got are building trades at 100% build out right now of their staff to modernize our infrastructure in Pennsylvania, to modernize the pipeline infrastructure so that we get affordable and abundant energy to consumers broadly across the region. We all use energy in one form or another. To have affordable energy delivered to their home is absolutely critical. And I think shale development has been an enormous winner. It has saved 41% of wholesale power generation costs. 57 to 81% of utility gas rates across Pennsylvania. Those are disposable income dollars that go directly back to every single consumer in the Commonwealth. All right, so we'll take one final comment and then we're I, gonna- I'm, not, I'm gonna stay away from this political discussion. <laughs> no, that, and I, that's okay. we'll, we'll, I wanna bring us back to the produced water absolutely. issues because I think we are, you know, at least that's near and dear to my heart, but I think that the questions about norm, we can deal with it. We can solve it. There are technical solutions as long as we realize that they need to be addressed. The questions about produced water, valued and recovering fresh water, that's also feasible. You know, we have technologies and people working on it. The, what I would like to encourage people to think about as is produced water as a resource. If Department of Energy can put a lot of money in trying to find rare earth elements and a ban of coal mine drainage, I'm sure there is a, elements like that in produced water and we'd be able to provide that, you know, as a resource for our economy. And so think of the produced water as more of a opportunity, you know, for us to do some innovative solutions. And if you can deal with that water, you can deal with any water because I've never seen anything so bad in terms of contamination <laughs> as a produced water. So if you figure out a way how to clean that up, that everything else is going to be walking apart. So I don't think we could possibly ask more in terms of wrapping up this particular panel than comments from our keynote speaker. So, so with that, um, I think we'll thank the panel, and I believe we are moving on to a break, and there's plenty to talk about. <laughs>